should be in the manual that I uploaded. The one in the blue type? Yep. Okay. Do you want me to go ahead and read it? Yeah, that's, that's, sort, of, that's sort of the issue and, and position mine together. So yeah, go ahead. Okay, our demand to Mayor Lori Lightfoot and the Sh City Sh Council of Chicago. We demand that you shut down Chicago's out of control and racist tax increment financing program immediately. We are fed up with paying higher taxes, regressive fees, and being saddled with payday loan store debt. We are tired of our public dollars lining the pockets of wealthy and clouded developers who then in turn shower you and the aldermen with campaign donations, all while our neediest communities suffer. M the TIF piggy bank now and send the funds in those accounts to the local units of government that should have received those funds in the first place. Cool. And so that's kind of the, that's kind of the issue and position combined, right? So if you look at our step one of the power matrix, we talk about what's our position. And in, the, in any position that you present in any campaign, your position should include, it should be a statement that includes what you think the problem is, how it should be solved, in which institution is responsible for solving the problem? You're on mute. Um, everybody, can, everybody can unmute themselves. So. I, I have the, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm screen sharing with the power matrix model. Should I? Should we start a, thir a third blank sheet and build it from there and keep the first two sheets so people can look at them if they want? Absolutely, that's great. Okay. Build, uh, here we find them all, perfect. Here we go, we'll, we'll start a third sheet. And I'll clean it. Clean it. Here we are in sheet three. So Milo, um, what I recommend this week, if you haven't, is mm -hmm. actually look at um, budget 101 recording and okay. TIF 101, right? That way you'll be caught up in terms of this power making stuff. You'll know sort of like what are the issues. Okay. Why I read some of the thing, some of the documents, but I didn't oh. watch them. So I was okay. looking at the like the Chicago budget and reading about the I was reading things. I didn't. Watch. Um, it'd be good to watch it if you can. I know it's, you know, I know it's tough. Trust me. I have like at least three hours of stuff for other groups I got to watch, but it's hard because when I'm done with this shit, I want to go binge on my Netflix and I want to sit there and watch another two hours of the same shit that I'm in. Oh, is this recorded? Sorry. But you know what I mean, right? I get it. So trust me, I get it. Um, but take it in as much as you can. So, you know, you know why we're taking this position mm -hmm. um, and sort of the history behind the context about why the Civic Lab is is taking this position. We've been working on this for the past seven years. We mm -hmm. started out with reform and, and it, get, it keeps getting worse, unfortunately. And so TIFs have been around since 86 and um, and the gross neg neglect, the gross criminality of how it's being implemented. It's kind of like I was interviewed the other day by uh, one of the local Gazette newspapers. He's like, well, why should, why should we, why can't we just reform it? I said, well, you've had since 86 to reform it and it's not working. So you know, when are you going to reform it? In 2050, when my kids are in the 30s? You know, it's like, come on. If you think you can reform it now, you haven't been, what, what have you been doing for the last 20 years? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So it's like kind of like, we're at this point of like, just put the money back, end the scheme. Um, a good portion of the TIF money actually comes from black and brown communities. And you keep telling us that we're broke. We don't have the money and resources for jobs, for violence prevention, quality schools. You no, know, it's just like really, and yet you can build brand new mega mega malls and mega cities in the north side. Mm -hmm. So the contrast is too much. And everyone, contrast. everyone, see the blank sheet. Excellent, cool. All right, so we know kind of what our position and issue is uh, for this campaign, and also just to let you know, the background also is we are um, subscribing to the Right to Development Charter of the United Nations as well. And you can look at the TIF elimination handbook as a preference about why we're putting this within that context. A lot of our economic justice work is about having communities, giving communities the power and the right to develop their communities the way they think fit. And that is an international human rights um, law or whatever you call it, policy, whatever. Um, cool. So sort of we know what our position is overall. And you can see it in the power matrix in its short version. TIF take money away from programs that benefit minority and impoverished communities and areas which are given to develop higher income regions instead. Of course, I know I want to use the word minority, but that's okay. We'll leave it there. A little bit 19th century, that's okay. Anyway, okay, so let's go ahead and go down step two. Are people clear about step one? 
Makes sense. Mm -hmm. Are there any questions or comments about it? It's okay if you if you need to know it, clarity. It's concise. Um, so, so in stating in your stating your position, what would be the features of of a good position statement? Are you asking them? Yes. Yes. Asking them. To be clear and concise. Put it in the chat. I believe that's a good one. Clarity, focus, right? Okay. Other other things that you think should be in the position statement. It's not a trick question. So just you know, know it, you know it. He just went over it. So um is it um, something that is really, really trivial? It, so it would be what? The issue that we're tackling should be what? Well, I put that it's important to provide a solution, not only the thing that you want to tackle, but secondarily to also provide a solution because you can't just say, well, get rid of this, but how? Okay. But yes, I, I agree. But should we, um, should it be something that touches people's lives? Have a sense of drama and importance? Yeah, okay. I think so. I mean, uh, does it get your blood pumping, or do you? Does your eyes glaze over and go? I have no idea. It's too jargony. It's too too small. Remember, remember from the lesson on organizing, picking an issue has to meet some criteria. So you could be pissed off about something. Hey, that guy took my parking space. He's rude, or. No, the issue has to be widely and deeply felt. Yeah, positive and proactive energy, right. So I'll say widely and deeply felt sense of drama and urgency. Okay, Any, that's all I wanna say about it, but I think it's important to, uh, to, to, to dwell on it. Absolutely, nope. Anything you wanna do, T, let me know, perfect. Um, cool. So then this next step is what we call deciding what the opposition would say about the issue, right? And so for ex the example we give you in the manual, and this is actually, this is actually a real example that came out of a real live campaign back in the nineties around multicultural education by young people. The world studies and American history requirements of Chicago public schools already provide students with enough education about racial and ethnic diversity, right? This was a response to the issue that was destated in this education campaign uh, in the step one. The Board of Education needs to create an ethnic studies requirement for all high school students that teaches them about the diverse racial and ethnic groups that make up Chicago in order to help combat racism and ignorance. And CPS's response was exactly what I just said right now. The world studies and American history requirements already provide students with enough education about racial and ethnic diversity. When you come up with the, with the opposition about the issue, um, your group is working on, write it in this matrix in the top right corner of the matrix. So what do you think would be, what would, what would the opposition say to our position in the matrix? And just freely talk about it. What do you think? For the TIFs, wouldn't they well, say that? How about the issue, um, yeah, about our issue of, you know, when, ending what the they say? What would they, what would they say? that, um, you know, remodeling the river walk and, you know, high, you know, high level in economic areas brings more uh, tourism to Chicago, which would bring more money to the city, which would, uh, they would say, probably be filtered back into our communities. 
Beautiful. And I like how you said it would be it would probably be filtered back into our communities, right? Mm hmm Well, that's the narrative that they would post on their, you know, PR. Right. And that's okay. that's a standard community development trickle down theory, right? Right. Reagan right. It'll somehow yeah. magically will show up in our neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. our, our 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 streets would be paved with with clean, you know, no potholes and mm -hmm. um, parks. Our parks would look lovely and just showered with with blessings and our kids would have to walk to school safely without being you know harassed um it's just an incredible trickle down approach right mm -hmm. so absolutely the option might say spending money high absolutely that's great what else anybody else what do you think the opposition would say i try to think kind of to the root as to why they're doing this why they insist to keep tiffs and I feel like it's just kind of, they would just turn a blind eye to it and say, well, we need TIFFs in order to complete the projects in town and provide fancy hotels and stuff. But I guess I think more of why are they doing this? What's the real reason underlying why they're doing this? And I think it kind of stems back from the marginalization of, you know African Americans and pushing them out and I it, it's disgusting to me and I right. think it all stems back to that whether they right. want to admit it or not right and so the best way to address that if that's how you feel in terms of your your position on this um, it's really critical to learn how to identify what the opposition would say mm -hmm. you got to put yourself in their shoes good organizers Put themselves good leaders and organizers will always put themselves in their opposition shoes right know the enemy know the opposition well from the inside out you're going to be more likely successful in taking that on so Sally, we get it that's where you think my guy it's marginalizing da, 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 we get that part but what do you think the opposition would say to all that why tips from their perspective from their angle i feel like they think that it's benefiting society and they don't even see, I feel like they would say, oh, well, it is benefiting, benefiting society because we're putting in so many new businesses when in reality, I mean, <laughs> now I keep going back to what <laughs> I think, but they would probably say like, it's needed. Right. So they so underneath what you're saying is an argument for subs because we're talking about a subsidizing private businesses, private developments is jobs. So the word the, the, the job word is what's dangled in many of these projects. So respond to that. So you're you're the person proposing a tip and you're saying, yeah, I'm going to I'm going to put 50 jobs in here. These these are jobs that uh, are needed. Does, does that land for you? Does that hold any water? Yeah, that's true. I didn't even think about that, that they could use the excuse of creating jobs um, in regards to TIFFs. All right, so hold on to that for a second. So say that is a, that is a, a strong argument for TIFFs. As an organizer, how would you begin to attack that, that claim or, or question it? What, how would you begin to think about that? well is it worth the marginalization of several other people and individuals and communities that don't have access to any resources whatsoever that's what i would say because i don't think that's worth it <laughs> okay keep I going question. so what are you what, what are you really asking when you when you're asking that when i ask that it's like i guess mm, Is it worth it to create 50 jobs within a TIF site that's benefiting affluent white communities compared to taking that money and putting it into um, a community that needs it? Is it worth it? Okay, so now you're starting to get some very essential questions, what you might call a trade-off. Something is being done instead of something else. That's an important distinction because the arguments for TIFFs sometimes they make it sound like it's free money right there's no losers so you're already 
pushing back on that. So you're saying there's a trade-off. Somebody gets something and somebody doesn't get something. Um, and so th that's, that, that in itself could be upsetting. You're up, like you're already saying, I'm questioning that frame. The other question that would be close to that and quickly aligned is, well, how much money are we talking about to subsidize the job? We're not disputing the fact that if you build a target with public money, they're going to be cash cashiers and managers and people working in the target. What are they making? Are there union jobs? Are those jobs of the future? I mean, that's a good question, right? Okay. So I'm just saying that this is good. This is good thinking to be able to receive the oppositional language and take it apart. And then you have something maybe to push back on. Yeah, you said you're creating 40 jobs. We'd like to know what they're, what you're gonna pay them. And where are, they, where are these people gonna come from? And I mean, and, and they may not be a good answer, but um, that's certainly a good place. It's a fruitful place to look. And the trade-off is, uh, I give you a billion dollar TIF and you're giving me 300 jobs, is that worth it? And those, and the majority of those people aren't from the south side or west side. So how does our, how do our neighborhoods benefit from, from that, from building a mega city right there at Lincoln Yards? You're building a $2 billion, a billion plus dollar mega city within a city. Um, I don't know if that, how would, how would south siders and west siders actually benefit from that? They wouldn't. <laughs> Right. I mean, I don't know, but show us the evidence. Right. I want the evidence based. I want to see the report that says this is how um, our neighborhoods would benefit from this $1.2 billion TIF. But you've already hit on when I think when Milo said the word filter down, that's already a good critique and not, not to be accepted lightly and just, and just accept. So there's a thing called trickle down economics that has been driving the Republican Party for 50 years. So there is a there is a there is a, a, a thought. I mean, there's a school of economic thought that is contrary to what, what I would call progressive economics. But there's a school of thought that says, yeah, the way to stimulate the economy is give rich people breaks, because then they'll go out and spend more money, or give a business a break, and they'll hire more people. And under the Trump administration, that's what happened. Uh, about a trillion dollars was was accrued by the by the America's billionaire class, but I haven't seen that trickle down. So, so, you know what you know when, when we're talking about trickling down, I mean we're talking literally. The, somebody's got five boats, and I and I maybe can buy a good dinner. I mean that's what we're you know that's the scale of what we're talking about in America. So what we're suggesting is on top of everything else. You need to be aware of the wealth disparities in America as part of your work to just know what the frame is. We're always talking about the frame and the context of this, of this work. And part of, sadly, the frame of America is this giant disparity of wealth. So if you know that going into a project, you can then bring that to your critical thinking. So I love that, Milo, that you used the word filter down. And that is absolutely something that we are confronted with. And they present it like, take the fucking crumb, uh, pardon me, take the crumbs, uh, mm -hmm. because that's all you're going to get. So you should be grateful, you know, that you're going to get something from the from the table. So absolutely, yeah. Um, there's a huge argument for that, and the reality is, yeah, they'll the argument. I was like, well, look what's happening to other parts of the world. We're lucky that we're able to you live in this city, enjoy the moment, you know. <laughs> Come from our own city officials. Well, what are you talking about? You don't like it? Leave Chicago. You can go anywhere else in the city and live. That was said by Mayor Daly, verbatim, to um uh, to when we were fighting for jobs for youth and 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 better schools. So they're absolutely, it's incredible. Cool. So now we know kind of what the opposition. How do you think? How you get into the opposition mind frame and perspective and why it's important, right? To um put yourself in their shoes and come up with strong oppositional statements to your own campaigns. In general, so that goes in the top right corner, and that sticky note which Tom is putting in there. Thank you, Tom. Um, and then so this next step, 
after you, you really, you really vet the opposition, you, you talk like we did, we come up with a strong oppositional statement that, um, that, is, that really challenges our position. Um, you then decide where your team falls in the matrix. So where do we fall? We're the team, the right to development team, the civic lab organizing team. We're trying to abolish this, 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 this corrupt racist scheme, this pay to play crap, this TIF, right? Um, where do we fall on this matrix, right? And so we take a yellow post-it note, yellow post note, we write the name of our team, we the civic lab organizing team, whatever you wanna call it. Uh, because the position we have stated is our team's position, the post-it note um, goes, of course, all the way to the left on the agreement side of the matrix, right? Um, that's, that's clear, right? But then we've got to decide where, do our, where, do, where does our power lie? How much power and influence do we actually have um, on the official decisions being made about this issue? Um, so that's when we get in a conversation. Where do you, what do you all feel like? Are we, are we, um, do we have, are we sitting at the decision-making table at the top? Are we like, are we like Lori's best friend and we're actually, you know, right there with her making decisions as the decision maker? Are we at, are we actually aldermen? Are we actually, are we at the table making, you know, are we that, you know, the top nonprofit teams committed and we're, we're the pet project of the, you know, the alderman caucuses and they love our ideas and we're sitting them with them designing um, policy and law. Or are we impacting public opinion? Do we have, are we really having a, a great visual sort of presence in the public mainstream of our media, uh, of our coverage, of our journal, you know, of opinion and a decision? Or do we just impact a public, a public opinion, but no decision? That we, we're great in the media, but we're not in terms of public decision? Or do we have zero impact? We're just, you know, not really making an impact. Um, so what do you all think? Where do you think we fall as a team on the issue? Share your thoughts, share your thinking. What do you think? I would say, yeah. um, I would say there is some impact on public opinion and decision. I would say right there, because I mean, we're not up with Lori Lightfoot making decisions. We aren't aldermen, but there is impact on the community around us. And people know it's definitely influenced me. So I would say that it does have an opinion or it has an effect on public opinion and decision. It's just my thoughts. What about you, Lucas? Emily, where, based on what you've been through, um, what you know, what's your perspective on this? Thank you, Celia. Yeah, I was gonna say what Cece said. Um, somewhere maybe in between public opinion, but not on decision makers and then public opinion and decision. Um, it seems like maybe that's the current goal is reaching out to more decision makers. So yeah. you think definitely public opinion, um, but a little, a little sort of in the middle on, on decision? Excellent, okay. What about you, Lucas? Yeah, I was gonna also agree with uh, what both, both y'all said. Um, going off of that, uh, you know, the people's voices is very important. And I don't think um, some of the higher power individuals, whether it's just in the city of Chicago or just in our government overall, um, allow individuals to really express their concerns and use their voices. Um, so I think that's something that you know, people in those types of positions need to uh, take into consideration more often. Okay. Okay. Um, I know, Milo, you're new, but what do you think, based on this, what you're able to catch up on or just in general from your own experience? Um, you, I think being a so South Sider. So, yeah. <laughs> I would think that it could change public opinion if it 
educated the public because if I asked my neighbors, I don't think, I don't know if anyone in my building would know what a TIF is. Um, mm. I mean, I'm 10 minutes from the city, but I mean, and in Beverly, um, people are connected to the aldermen and, you know, as far as trickle down, like people's pockets are aligned. Uh, so it feels like you always can follow the money. So right. um, like, I believe the alderman from Beverly is good friends with politics. I mean, mm -hmm. he's in a good position. Um, so as far as public opinion, I think it could be changed if it was, if you educate the public and put the information out there because how can you oppose something that you don't even know is oppressing you? So education, so it has, it seems like it has the power to change public opinion. Um, if the word is so out there. Hearing, hearing uh, your thoughts, I placed the uh, sticky note sort of in between the, the measure of impact on public decision you know we, we we are we are doing a lot of public work so we've done 170 public meetings and a lot of our work has been covered by the hyper local press you could add to that 7,000 people on our mailing which is which is small but still people are connected with each other so all that would be evidence that yes the civic labs work can uh educate the people so that's that would be a a, a check mark on that and that um, those meetings have had a trickle up effect, if you wanna think of it that way, and have put pressure mm -hmm. on aldermen and decision makers and other policy places like labor unions and grassroots organizations who use this work. And now you see them getting militant on tips. They haven't quite joined our camp, but they're harsher than they were. So I would say that would be, our, that would be a, a evidence to place the the, the sticky notes somewhere around there. Okay, so you see how see how you guys are thinking to ask these questions. Like, what would be the evidence? Like, suppose CC said, "No, I think the I think the thing should go up up here." Right, that would be her judgment. Then Jonathan would push back and say, well, "Okay, who of us this because we're the team? Who of us is sitting at the table?" So if your answer is, oh, I don't know, I just kind of feel that, it can't sit, it's gotta go back. So you have a theory and you may say, I think it's somewhere, but then you've got to back it up. Oh, CC says, my best friend is Lori Lightfoot's accountant. And I talk to Lori all the time. Oh my goodness. Well, now maybe CC can get us. Maybe we should push our sticky note a little further up than we thought, because we didn't know. But that's part of the work. You're always inventorying each other to say, hey, Milo, I didn't know you're in Beverly. Your sister-in-law is, is Alderman Jones. I didn't know that. Well, can Alderman Jones get us a meeting with? So um, that's part of that. You know, you know, if we were actually a team, you know, working on this assiduously, we would have known this about each other. We would have known that Lucas is, you know, a former policeman or Emily is, you um, her family is uh, real estate owners or something. We would know all that about each other to be able to populate this thing. Okay, enough of that. Awesome. Any questions about that? That, that step? Excellent. This is beautiful. Okay, cool. And remember, any camp, every campaign on, the, on this planet, especially in this country that I know of, does some type of power matrix analysis, right? I mean, it's, you know, every sector does some type of market analysis, right? You're in the business sector. You, you have tons of analysis for it. internal, external market, all that stuff. So what we're doing is, is very standard operating protocol in terms of building out um, a campaign strategy. Um, this power matrix specifically comes from our youth organizing direct action campaigns in the southwest side of Chicago. And so this was used dozens of times to launch campaigns for jobs, education, um, healthcare services for young people across the city. Cool. All right. So step four. Now that you got step three, awesome. Step four. Now we need to decide who our target is. The target is the person in charge of the institution that we think is responsible to make change. Right. 
Um, we need to write his or her name on a pink slash purple post-it note. Does the target is, is the decision maker. The post-it note should go all the way up on level five on the right side of the matrix. And then we, get, we again decide where the target fits on the scale between agreement and opposition, right? In terms of our position. And then we place the note where it should fall. And then we can also add what we call secondary targets. We want to identify a primary target, that key decision maker who can get what we want. Right? And here's the thing. Um, it's counterintuitive sometimes. We think, well, if we just be nice, we just do this. Actually, when you peel away, when you pull the curtain back, you, you get to see who all the wizards are, who actually can make the decisions, right? These are systems, but people, systems are made up of people, human beings, right? And so there is a primary person that can make the decision in terms of our position. And then there are secondary targets. These are the people that have direct influence um, in the way the decision is being implemented. Um, they have direct influence on the primary target, right? Um, and so there, there's, there's maybe multiple secondary targets that you wanna um, uh, look for when you're doing a, a campaign, an organizing advocacy direct action campaign. Who do we think is our primary target that can give us what we want in terms of our position? Speak freely, open up, speak. Lori Lightfoot. And, why, and, and again, what's the question we ask? Whether or not she has power. As a mayor, I feel like she has power. Why is, why is, she, why is she the primary target? Why? Why do you, why? Give us the background. Um, simply because, well, I had it on our sticky note, like the specific details, and I'm trying to remember what I put. Um, but basically, um, let me see what I put. Oh, we just put names. Oh, nope. Doesn't she control the tips? Reform. Okay. Isn't it? Yep, that's Who's, what we put right there. Sorry. Who said control the tips? Right. She, she controls the tips and that's under her list of the things that she has control over as the mayor. As the mayor, right, right. It's a state law, but municipalities decide how the, what happens with it, right? And it's under the purview of the mayor and the city council, right? They control the tips. So the primary target is Lori Lightfoot, and she's proven that, right? Right? She, she proved it within the first six months of her um, new administration, right? She, I take 250 million and give it to the black and brown neighborhoods as a third prize, second and third prize. You didn't get the billion dollars, you didn't get the Lincoln Yard if we'll give you, you know, we'll give you some change. We'll give you a couple, couple, couple hundred million to spread around 10 neighborhoods around with 500,000 people <laughs> versus Lincoln Yards. You get a billion too. Thank you. What's his name? What's that which guy's name? Stoning Bay. Thank you. Here's your 1.2 billion dollars. Zero people. Less than less than 200 acres, but you get over a billion. But you know what? I'm Lori Lightfoot. I'm gonna make sure you know my people get at least 100 million <laughs> spread around 10 huge neighborhoods in Chicago. So we know she has some. She has that type of control. Excellent. Who are some? Who are the secondary targets? Just think of um, secondary targets. City council. Okay. And so let's say city council. And in a, in a matrix like this, we try to drill down to the people. We always want to be specific, as specific as possible because in the end, that's what it takes. It's the details, right? Now you say city, who in city council? Is it just everybody? Is there, how do we know? Is there, is there, you know, we can't, do we have the capacity to go after all 50 aldermen? Probably not, right? Based on what, you know, you probably think that, right? You know us. You know, we're not the we're not the YMCA of organizing. We don't have the multi millions of dollars. And if we did, do we go after every alderman? Do we go after some? Who do you think in city council would be um, secondary targets in this? Um, the aldermen of the communities that we want to 
get the money to go to instead of the Northsiders. Great idea. I never thought of that. I'm gonna have, but never. The all of the communities that we want the money to go to, right? Mm -hmm. So if they, could, if our communities, well, well, if us as the community members write to our aldermen and we create noise that they can't quiet down, then they have to speak up for us too. And then they have to do their job and work for the people instead of campaign donors. Okay, I can see you've been trained well in South Side politics. So, well, if you live on the South Side, you know, you know that how the how it works. Right. Money. That's right. That's right. Oh, he who screams the loudest gets the gets the, gets the change, gets the funny pot. Because the aldermen like their position of power, and they're not going to change it unless you make them change it. Because mm. they're comfortable. So she she you like created, Mando Shea, he's comfortable. You use the word create noise. So mm -hmm. then you, you, you would park that idea and, and, and we return to it later. If the group accepts this idea, like, yeah, Lori Lightfoot, she's definitely the primary target and we're gonna think about that. But we really like this idea of targeting aldermen in deprived communities. So now that raises some questions of, well, which are those communities? Do you, can you say off the top of your head of the 50 wards, which are the ones that are hurting the most. So there's a kind of a like side. The 19th ward, the 22nd ward, the 20th. And... Well, you, you start okay, reeling off. Did you say 19th you ward? What else did you say, Milo? 20th? 20th? I think the ward. 20th and 22nd. I think these are south side wards. Yeah. So those are your, so you, those would be uh, wards of people of color, right? And so you would say, okay, let's remind ourselves, let's look at the ward map and remind ourselves mm -hmm. which wards are the wards that are predominantly black or uh, Latinx. And we have that map. So we would be able to answer that question very quickly. It's not, it's not a, a guess. We would tell you, oh, 50 wards. There are three that are non-majority. There are 16 that are black. There are 13 that are um, Latinx. And there's like three or four that I would, I would say are majority white. And they go, okay, great. Now what? So you see how one thing leads to another. And then you would, we would get to this you know, at a later stage. Cool. Right. And so I, I would just say one thing, caveat, is that we don't do this in a later stage. This is where you actually do it in the stage. You want to be specific now. And so this is a moment where we're in like literally, if this was if this was not COVID, we're in a retreat for two days. We're in this, we're in a boardroom. Um, our task is to put together a matrix that's detailed. We would literally be sitting there with our computers up. Okay, well, give me the list of 11 awards, list of awards. List, who's the ultimate? Okay, boom, boom. The chief of staff, boom, boom. You would literally see a wall with names, you know, as detailed as possible, right? And then you would extract that and put it into an electronic version. And now these days you can do straight in. So, yes, the, the, the top black and brown wards impacted the most by this, right? On the south side and west side. And there may be a north side one. We know that north side, there may be, you know, Rogers Park, uptowns, a little bit more diverse. Let's see how they're being impacted. Let's see if there's a base inside the inside stronghold of the north side that we can we can take advantage of. And so, yes, we and we have all the information in our databases and, and access and online and a lot of stuff. Excellent. So you get an idea, right? Identifying secondary targets. And what, I would say a secondary target would be um, not only those aldermen, but I would think the finance committee. I was, the, gonna, the, I was just going to say, what committee tar targets? So you guys have to know. Down. You, you have to know how your council is constructed. So um, it's a very big body with 50 people, right? And there's all there's there's an aviation committee and there's a culture committee and there's you know parks committee. So there's lots of committees working every week with agendas and hearings possibly, and you know, um, and and each committee has a budget and da -da 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 -da. so wouldn't it be interesting to know if um, the finance committee that Jonathan just mentioned, which is a very good idea, wouldn't it be interesting to know if um, half of the committee members of the finance committee come from black and brown wards that are getting screwed? Mm -hmm. So now you, you're holding a couple of things in the same space. You're saying, okay, we're thinking about aldermen, but we're not sure which aldermen, we got to do a little research. 
we're not sure how the city council is constructed. We got to go remind ourselves about that. Oh, look at that. Finance committee overlaps with aldermanic composition. Now we're getting some very good ideas about the top five aldermen we might want to approach. Yes? Cool. So secondary target alderman, add another post-it um, specific committees or add it to the post-it there. So we want to do, I literally want to do aldermen. We know which ones. Um, Milo said we want to target um, certainly the aldermen that, re that represent wards that would get some of this money. We want it, that's, a, that's the carrot and stick approach. Alderman, um, whatever, from the 20th Ward, did you know you're being cut out of millions of dollars <laughs> through this TIF process, right? That's what you present. Do you want that money or not for your ward? Oh, shit, that'd be great. But then, okay, this is how we're showing you a solution. You know? 20th Ward, that's Alderman Taylor's ward, the new, the new progressive alderman. You're getting cut out, et cetera, et cetera. Cool. And then, of course, then committees. Which committees? What are the specific committees that we want to target? Finance, budget is definitely one. Um, maybe there's a maybe there's a committee, maybe there's a development urban development committee or you know something somebody that some committee that works with the development side of zoning and uh, all those type of things, processing of stuff as well. Cool. Oh yeah, the zoning. Any other questions? Yeah. You know, all right, so we get an idea, right? Are there any other secondary targets you think of? I can think of a secondary target. Think big. Where did TIFs come from? Could be also some uh, big corporations in the city of Chicago. Like, like Lucas, do you have any ideas? Um, could, uh, what about what used to be called the Sears Tower? Would that work as far as like a big corporation receiving a lot of money through TIFFs? That would be more opposition, probably. Those would be probably those might be might be the oppositional groups, and we're going to get that's one of the steps is identifying who would be our opposition. But remember, the target is the people that can make the decision and give you what you want in terms of your campaign. Um, so you know, may, they may have influence on the primary targets, the secondary targets, but they're not necessarily the ones that are signing. The law, or saying we're going to end this, or we're going to we're going to abolish this. We think we agree. We, we, we bought into this, or we were forced into it. By a campaign. Um, but I, when I say think big, I'm thinking about where did tips come from? Who established tips from your tip camp, from your tip training? Did the mayor establish the tip program? The developers, right? Developers are part of it. But who actually put it into law? Which entity, which institution made it a law? We know municipalities are implementing, are executing the law. They're, they're the ones who, who get to decide how the law is executed on the ground based where you're at. There's TIFs in the suburbs now. There's TIFs all over the county, right? Not just Chicago. But who actually made it a law? Which, which, which unit of government made it a law? Was it local government? No. Say it, you know it. Which the state government? Yeah, don't say it with confidence. It's not a trick question. It's all, it's all in front of you, right? The state government, it's okay. You guys gotta feel confident about your answers. It's like, this is not a test. This is not a right or wrong test. You're not gonna fail social justice work. You're not, you're gonna, <laughs> you're gonna get your hours approved. Nope, you failed, sorry, you get your hours. No, we're not doing that. We're not redacting your hours. So it's the state government, right? So think about that. Now that's a big government, right? So then what we do is we gotta think about who is state government? It's the same process, right? 
and then we think about well, who who do we have influence in from Chicago? Who's our who's our who's our people in state government? Who do we select? If you're from Illinois, you had elections, you voted. Some of you can vote here too as students if you want. Did anybody vote in the past election here? Milo, did you vote? Yeah. Yes. You didn't? Yes, I did. No, you didn't. That's okay. You just said you did you say no? No, I did vote. Okay, well you don't have to tell us who voted, but who 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 won the election? All right, so come on. Who won the election? In state politics. Who won the election for governor? Do you know who your governor is? Oh, Pritzker. Yes, JB Pritzker, right? Mm -hmm. And who is JB Pritzker? Come on, Lucas, Emily. Who's J.B. Pritzker? You don't know who he is? Is he a real estate Elliot? developer? He's a mogul, right? He's a, he's a, he's a, what, is he a billionaire? From he's technology. A, he's, a, he's a multimillionaire, right? The Pritzker family, right? You ever walk downtown, you see the Pritzker Pavilion, right? You hang it out. Oh, a million park students. Oh, we love Chicago. We love being here. You know, you're, at, you're there. It's called the Pritzker Pavilion, right? Why is it called? It's the Pritzker family, right? They're huge benefactors, million, multi-millionaires, many of them are, right? JB is one of them, right? And he's the new governor. And the majority of people in Chicago who voted, voted for who? JB, the Democratic, the Democratic candidate, right? And who is his lieutenant governor? The first black woman lieutenant governor. Who is that? Come on, women. Come on, men, activists, right? I mean, this is a big deal, right? Historically, right? Power of, of, of the power of the, the decade of the women, power, female pride, women pride. Juliana Stratton. Yes. First mm -hmm. black woman. Okay. It, that's fine. I don't care how you get it. You just answered it. The first black woman lieutenant governor of the state of Illinois. Now that's a huge victory, right? For us, for all of us, especially for also women, right? Mm -hmm. and, and so to me, my suggestion would be, wow, wouldn't it be great to get people at the state level start singing our song, singing our tune, right? Does that make sense? Because they have so much influence in the city of Chicago politics, right? Right? Congressional, the state back pockets is so connected. It's so connected to Chicago politics, right? So let's just think about that. Who in state government? Um, who do you think we could be our secondary targets um, in terms of influence, right? So we got JB, Governor Pritzker, especially now that, especially since several of their initiatives around racial equity are failing. <laughs> They're really under the gun now. Did you guys know that, right? Right. Do you know that the, uh, the cannabis equity work is failing? It's not. It's not. It's not working. They're not producing yeah. what they thought they could produce, right? Criminal justice. There's challenges in the R three funding that's been generated by the new cannabis industry. There's challenges in terms of supporting, you know, local grassroots. Um, we call minority companies, right? Women Didn't and- Didn't they not approve uh, the application of different um, people of color trying to uh, start cannabis um, distributors and- Cannabis distributors, right? Mm -hmm. So there's that, that's the primary- They used a right? lottery. They yeah, called it a exactly. lottery. You know, right. And that's one, there's another layer. The funds generated from the industry are put into a special pot to um, bring reparations or equity to criminal justice, right? Money is supposed to go to, to sort of uh, repair harm that's been done by the criminal justice system towards African-American communities and minority communities, right? Mm -hmm. And so a lot of groups applying for that money that we know of, or some groups applying that are, are led by minorities and women are being denied access to those funds, aren't getting the funds and they're giving funds to some of the mainstream groups. So there's a lot of pressure. So you have to know the pressure points, right? This is the conversation we would have, we're having. Oh, we know Lieutenant Governor is under the gun. Davey's under the gun. This could be a great racial equity win. 
for the governor to say, hey, I support the Civic Lab and their campaign, the right to development by black and brown communities in Chicago. Yeah, you know that'd be an incredible victory publicly, right? Mm -hmm. Even though he can't make the decision because he's not the mayor, but a, in terms of public opinion, for the governor to come up in, co in contradiction to the mayor on this issue would be an incredible victory, right? For us. Cool. All right, so you get the point. Any other, you get the point about secondary targets. You're having a little conversation. You're, we're having, we're, we're knowing where are the pressure points, where's the influence, who can we win to our side? Move them closer from opposition to the right and get them closer to the middle. Right? The closer you get them to the middle, the more likely you have, you can get them to your side. Cool, excellent. Step four, step five, who are our allies? Right, and who are the allies? When we say ally, what does that mean? Someone that's on your side or supports your position. Yes, absolutely. At the end of the day, someone that's on your side and supports your position. And so on yellow notes, who do you think are some of our allies? And then we decide where the ally fits on the power, right? Delia, because, you know, I'm Jonathan Peck. I love you guys. I support you. But guess what? I don't have a pot to piss in. You know, I can influence my kids. But that's it. Maybe give you 10 bucks. But I love you. I'll be your best cheerleader. Do I have a lot of impact? A lot of influence? Maybe not. So we got to decide who the allies are. And then on the left side, because they agree with us, they're already to the left, right? They support our position. We have to then decide how much influence they have in terms of power. No impact, public, the same, the same metric scale, right? So who are some of our allies? Who would you consider thinking about the landscape, the civic landscape of Chicago? Just yell them out. Thanks. Emily Lucas, what do you guys think? Go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say other nonprofit organizations. I know why, and I listed some on our uh, on our um, jam board there. Okay, which ones? Other non NPOs potentially, absolutely. Go to your jam board if you can, or if you remember about that. So other NPOs, right? But, and which which ones? Give, yeah, give me a give me just for for, for examples the, the most the most powerful one you can think of and, and and we'll use that as a case. I'm just looking now. Remember and how yeah, it may be the most powerful one or it may be ones that what? Why would they why would they be fully why would they be our allies? What would there be their purpose? Maybe the most powerful one wouldn't be your ally. Maybe like screw that. We 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 got TIF money. <laughs> we're, we're good. We got our we got our crumbs, right? So which ones and why? So let's start with the why then. Why would a nonprofit organization be our ally and support this? Our numbers. Our numbers. So I run a nonprofit organization called the Harris Peck Social Service Agency. And I got, you know, a couple thousand kids and families in my program all year round. Um, and you come to me and say, we would love your support. Why, why would you come to me in the first place? They would also benefit from the demolition of TIFs. And why? Keep going with that. Because I, they- My service area the is in the South, what? Because they also need resources to be redistributed to our communities. Right, because my service, who do I service? Most of my service people I service are, are kids and families that live um, in the 20th Ward, Inglewood, and um, North Lawndale. Two hardest, some two hardest hit neighborhoods in the city. Mm -hmm. And I don't see any love. I'm struggling. Give me, but this, this still, for the sake of the argument, give me one organization that fits these criteria that we're talking about. I put them in... Give me one one and we'll put it on the post. Well, we had written down, um, raise your hand for Illinois public education. Looks like Wyatt mm. put that. And then, um, you know, we put our schools, DePaul and Adler, um, who often advocate for social justice and social change. 
so likely they would be I'd hope they would be allies so like the boys and girls club hmm. just let's let, let's just dwell on that one because you those are all good candidates but let's just st stick with the raise your hand and let's talk about that for a minute and and what your arguments would be to place them where on the on the jam board so that's an excellent uh candidate Where would you want to place them? Great candidate. Where do you think that, where do you think they would they fall as an ally? Mm. Right? Impact, no impact. Right? Impact on public opinion, but not decision. Impact on public opinion decision. Where do you think they fall along the power power matrix? I would say about the same as civic lab. Okay, and why? Because they're not up there with Lori Lightfoot, you know, making those decisions or the aldermen, though they are a nonprofit organization that has spread awareness and aims to empower those in the community. So they do have an effect on the community. So I would put it maybe in about the same spot. That's just what I would. Okay. Remember there's two dimensions. The level of power, so, so that is to say, how can they impact party. the decision, and also the level to which they agree with us. Mm. So do we know that Raise Your Hand agrees with abolishing tips, or are they just One, mildly hostile? Yeah. We oh, are not yeah. sure. From what I know, I'd, I'd probably put them closer to the middle. Um, we're not sure, but um, given past engagement with other groups, a lot of the groups tend to fall in the more in the middle. Um, cool, excellent. And we do the same thing for Adler. We do the same thing for Paul, right? Um, boys and Girls Club, let's take that one. Where do you think boys and girls, would they be an ally for us? Who, who knows? Um, but they are sort of like the McDonald's of, 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 of social services, right? My experience, they don't tend to rock the boat. When it comes to advocacy work, they like mm. to keep their corporate donors. Mm. They like to make sure that you know they might. They might. They, they, they may even side with us, but they may be like, you know what? Behind closed doors, we love you guys, but we mm. can't come up. That's happened a lot in my career. I've had, you know, a lot of groups say, "We love you guys. You guys are great. Take it on, Mary. To go for the job, and if you get jobs, let us know. We'll help you distribute them, but we can't come out publicly against the mayor because we get contracts." Right. Mm -hmm. And so there's a lot of that, that kind of back and forth negotiations going on with your allies trying to figure out, do they agree with us? Why? Why not? Where do you think they fall in um, and stuff like that? Right. But I would say if there are groups that are servicing the communities that Milo mentioned, the wards, go into those wards that are hit the hardest and find the groups that are supposed to be servicing those constituents. You might find stronger allies because what's happening? They ain't getting the resources they need. We know this already. I mean, we can drill down, but we know generally the wards that are hit the hardest generally don't have the resources they need. And the groups that are that are that are mandated to help address those needs generally don't get the resources they need. The zero-sum game in the nonprofit sector, right? That's what usually happens. Outside your McDonald's, your YMCA, your Boys and Girls Club, your United Way, you're looking for really groups in the neighborhoods, on the corner, right? In the blocks. Um, those are the groups you want to find because those are the groups that have wealth. They may not have money and very little resources, but what do they have? What do we call that in organizing world? What do you think? What do they have? Passion and commitment. Passion, commitment. What else? Asset mapping. What else do they have? Think about assets. Community members. Community members, right? They're working with the people hit the hardest. They're on the ground. Milo and Silly are running their, their, their women's apartment program in the heart of Inglewood. They've got 100 young sisters they're working with. They may not have a lot of money, but somehow they've got that relationship, that connection to the people. 
if we can get them and get them organized around this, what would that do? Imagine 100 sisters with Milo and Celia taking on. Imagine that snapshot in the press. Boom. Inglewood is on the map taking on, asking for more resources, right? You've got to think that deep in terms of layers, in terms of your allies. You have to ask those questions, right? I may not, I have 2,000 people I serve. I don't have a lot of resources, um, but definitely you can come do education workshops and let the people decide where they want to land. I'll give you access to my sports programs, my after-school services, and you can educate them about budgets and finances and let them as Meant as taxpayers make the decision of where they want to land on this, right? That's the conversations and the work behind the matrix that you want to get to. Cool? Awesome. Excellent. Okay. Um, that's the allies piece. Anything else, Tom, on the allies piece? Um, well, I put in the chat a little bit of what Jonathan uh, is saying here. So since you've done your asset mapping, you'll know who is who in your community. So you'll know that there's a, there's a church, there's a health, there's a kitchen, there's a, a drug counseling center, there's a youth after school program. You'll know these things and you will know who is leading them. Now you may not have a relationship with them, but you'll know, oh, Pastor Jones has an after whatever, whatever program that's been running since, 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 since whatever, whatever. And they serve 50 meals a week. That's part of your base knowledge. Now, is Pastor Jones a candidate for this work again we don't know so part of someone would say well i know pastor jones that's my mother's whatever whatever or i go to pastor jones okay okay tom we delegate you to uh, visit make a relationship meeting with pastor jones and we're going to have a team and visit with him and here's what we're going to bring to him so what should we bring to him we'll bring the study we'll bring the whatever whatever we'll bring the, the latest study from the department of uh, housing that said there's a, all these homeless people because it's we see it every day. So you have to decide what will move yeah, pastor. Yeah, and then yeah. um, the thing that's missing is you got to make the connection to your, your, your issue. No, here. He, he's probably going to know how many people are homeless. He's going to know a lot, but he may not know this other thing about how TIFs are harming. So we have to help pastor connect the dots. So that's the meeting. And are you going to be good at it? Well, you're going to have to role play which again is another part of this work. So, so Milo will pretend to be the pastor and CC will, will pretend to be the delegation leader and they'll actually have a little, like my uh, pastor Milo, thank you for greeting me and meeting me. We have some material, you know, and you'll go through it and then you'll, you'll critique it. And then you'll sit and go, you know, CC, you, you forgot the point about blah, blah, blah. And then you'll build a strong little team. All right, you go see pastor Milo or pastor Jones, you do your meeting and you're going to ask him, at the meeting, Pastor, have we persuaded you that these TIFs are part of the problem connected to your work? And he may say, mm, I don't know. He may say, yes, I didn't know any of this. So again, what the pastor says will inform you. So I'm, you may have I'm to have a second meeting. He may say, I've known a little bit, but you guys have really opened my eyes. I'd like to share this with my um, senior leaders, my, 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 uh, my lay team. My, the people who are not paid, but they're uh, ministers or, and others who are. So now you see how we're going? Now you're building a thinking, oh my goodness, now we're going to have a meeting with 12 people. And they know less than the pastor, but they know more than the average person. So now we have to prepare a meeting for these guys. Very, You're very busy. <laughs> but right. that's how it goes. So, that's that's yep. all. And, that, that, yeah. And the lastly, um, you have to know the issues and the needs of the communities that you you, and peoples that you want to join your campaign, right? If you know that, I know the nonprofit groups working on these issues, and these are the issues where TIF money is being is where money is being taken away from, right? We know TIF is taking money away from what units of government. Where's what money is being taken away? Which 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 services are being impacted when TIFs are being used? Come on, remember what units of government are being impacted by TIFs? The, the extraction of money from property taxes, which units of governments are the, are the losers? You remember Lucas, Emily? Celia, remember? Parks, remember the property tax? Remember the breakdown? 
56% of, of every dollar in property tax dollar goes to what institution? Chicago. Schools? Yes. Chicago Public Schools. More than half of every dollar goes to the Chicago Public School System. So when you're taking money away, putting it into TIFs, what's the primary institution that gets impacted? Those schools. Schools. And then also city services, right? Parks, libraries. You know the breakdown. We know the percentage breakdown, right? So then you part of your asset mapping and going out to allies, you want to find allies who are working on these issues, right? Schools, parks, libraries. Find the local organization that, that is talking about we want to expand public parks in the South Side and make sure they get equitable funding, right? South Side is for South Side what parks? There's a there's an actual organization, right? Find that group. They're fighting for more money from the park system, and they're realizing they're getting dipped. Our parks aren't like the ones over in the North Side. Why is that? Milo, Sally, you guys, we know why. Because money is coming from TIFF. That's how you find the needs and the interest of these groups and you attach and tether that to your, to your campaign. Say, this is a way to address that. We know that South Side and West Side Parks don't get the resources compared to North Side Parks. There's no, there's no movie in the park <laughs> in Inglewood Park. You think we got movie no. in the park? You want, you already got any no movie in the park in Glassworth Campus where my kids play baseball? There's no movies in the park there. I gotta go drive them all the way downtown, up Lakeshore Drive, to that north side park, right? That's you got to find those issues and needs, you know. I just put cool. in the chat oh, a link. Park, right? Yeah. So, along this line, this is how you're doing it real time. So, say say you your say your target right. for this meeting is I a park lover, and there. and for recreation and for I open didn't space. That they that um also. uh that. Uh, is important. So you need to know that Friends of the Parks has done a study on inequitable funding of parks from black and white communities. So you may not have known that. So you'd have to do a little research. You might I have to call someone and said, who, who, who amongst us knows about parks? And some might say, oh, wait a minute. Uh, isn't there a group called Friends of the Parks? So you got to add that to your resume. Check them out. And guess what? They've got a very nice study. You look at that study and you lift out the information that's gonna help your, your case. And guess what? There's the charts, there's information that you can grab and turn it into your own language and bring it. You can actually bring it to, with you and, and help make the sale. Because again, the person that you're talking to may or may not have seen that study, but you know it. Absolutely, thank you, Tom. That's exactly it. For every ally, you're presenting your case. So you have to do the research, get the evidence, and show them why they should be part of this campaign using their data. So if I'm a workforce, um, I was, you know, I'm a work for, I'm a group that works on jobs, and I'm always struggling to get jobs for my black and brown kids, my poor kids in my neighborhood. Hell, I I, li I work in Bridgeport, you know, historically white neighborhood, and I got a ton of people that aren't working in my neighborhood. What are you going to do about it? You want me to work on your campaign? What does that have to do with my with my workforce project. I'm trying to get, get jobs and keep them in jobs. I barely got enough money for the, for the 100 people that I got right now. What did you know? Boom, 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 boom. You gotta show them, right? Did you know that your neighborhood is, you know, is on hit list? And that, you know, TIF funds are whatever, 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 right? So you gotta do all that research. When you identify your possible allies, you go back and you do the research and you begin to put basically a case statement that you could present in an elevator speak, an elevator, an elevator type speech, mm -hmm. but start winning over your allies, right? Cool. Thank you, Tom. Appreciate that. Could you also put the link for the um, that I'm never mind. Don't worry about it. Check out the TIF 101 Power Deck. In there, you'll you'll go back and visit it. You'll see the breakdown of units of government, right? Like eight cents for eight 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 things, eight cents for libraries. Um, you know, fifty six cents for every dollar goes to Chicago Public Schools. You know, et cetera, et cetera. 12 cents, I think, for whatever, whatever. So cool. All right. What's next? What's the next step? What's the next step? Where are you? 
after we kill allies, what do we do now? Step, we're, we're at step six. I'm gonna read me step six. Opposition? Yep, go ahead. State it like a fact, not a question. Okay. You get the manual. Um, on green post-it notes, write down the names of individuals and organizations that you think disagree with our position. Um, place right. them on the power matrix based on how strongly they agree with the opposition and how much power they have to influence the issue. All right. So go ahead. Name some name some opposition. Lucas, you you started that conversation. So back when you talked about Big Corp, go ahead and take us through it. Um, I don't really know where to start. Uh, I, it's, 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 you, you were in the right place. Just think who benefits from the thing that we're opposed to. In along, along with the big corporations y'all are saying? Which corporations? Which corporation specifically? Uh, Take a stab. Do you have you been downtown? Chicago or not? I'm from the suburbs. You never visited Chicago? Well, okay, so Navy Pier. Oh wow, huge. You couldn't uh, you could right talk, you could even what about Navy Pier? Go ahead. Yeah, they just continue to re receive a lot of money and continue to do a lot of remodeling, um, whereas the money uh, should be uh, distributed to other areas that don't receive the same amount of resources and opportunities, such as Navy Pier. Well, just remember what a TIF does. The money goes to do, so to do something, and somebody receives that money. Who is receiving the money? What, who are they? What kind of what kind of a business are they? Um, what does what what does Navy Pier? Who are they servicing? Who do they who do they, who are their customers? I would say, in my opinion, uh, tourists. I don't think that individuals of Chicago actually benefit from Navy Pier, but that's just my opinion. Okay, so keep going. So Navy Pier, let's use Navy Pier as the opposition group. Put that in the tag. As potential opposition, absolutely. Good, good, good. Actually, that's a very good, um, very good choice for all sorts of reasons, right? Um, excellent, excellent. So, and how much power do you think they have in this issue? As in terms far of power and agreement. Do you think they have a lot of power on this, on, on, in terms of influ power and influence? Um, who specifically are you referring to, if you don't mind me asking? I just want to clarify. Look at the dashboard. Look at the Jamboard. The group that you mentioned. Opposition. Oh, not, not probably not any. Really? Oh, uh, okay. I might be a little bit confused now. If I'm being so honest, we're looking at opposition groups. Those groups that oppose our issue and our position, right? And you mentioned oh. Navy Pier being one of those groups. Okay, and sorry. So now we got to decide I... how much do they agree or disagree. Obviously, in their opposition side, they would be on the disagreement side, right? Where Tom is showing you. And then now we've got to decide how much do they disagree and how much power influence do they have on this issue? Okay, I apologize. Um, yeah, so Navy Pier would have a lot of power itself. Mm. Um, and I was just referring to the individuals in Chicago as far as like, their opportunities, they would not be able, they were, they are not receiving the money or the financial stability that the um, companies at Navy Pier are receiving. That's what I was trying to say before, if that makes sense. So I, I put 
down Navy Pier as an example of groups that uh, promote tourism. But there's a, another group that should be the number one opponent. No, you need, yeah, go ahead, Emily. Like developers? Yes, and when, I, when you say developer, what do you mean? Um, the companies that are being paid to hire the contractors and the labor unions that are building the buildings and reconstructing the Ferris wheel uh, or whatever else. Right. So the companies that get the contracts to build? Yes. Right. Ash cows, right? <laughs> right. So then we would have to go in and find out who are those top 10 developers that the city does what? Contracts with consistently. Right? And then at the same time, who are the top five? I'm talking about hard costs, so this money is not just for developers, but what's the other groups that do the other groups? What, what, who are the, what groups do what? Build things, right? Construction companies, right? Because this money goes to hard costs, building the mall, building the mega hotel, building the, the concert venue at Lincoln Yards, right? So we want to find out who are the top five construction companies that always get those these contracts, right? Because if you find that out, then you can begin to dispel the myth that it's actually creating jobs for everybody. No, you keep going to the same 10 people over and over again. You're making this company, you know, that's not really spreading the love. <laughs> hey, it's kind of unfair. Kind of, you're creating monopolies, right? Monopoly over this situation, right? But I want to go back to Navy Pier. Because I think that's really a, an equally powerful one because of how Navy Pier is situated in the context of civics and work in Chicago, right? Because it actually came up a few years ago under Mary Manuel, right? And it was part of the tip presentation. I don't know if we did part of it, but to recap, Tom may explain it better, but I'll take a stab at it. You can jump in. Navy Pier, um, Mary Manuel was originally going to take some TIF money and put it to the building of the Marriott Hotel and McCormick Place, right? How many people have been there, right? Yeah, I, I have been there, it's beautiful. In fact, uh, it's funny, um, Lieutenant Governor Stratton, who's a friend of ours, um, had her um, celebration there, her victory celebration at that hotel, at McCormick Place. Um, great store downstairs, right? And so, that was a big stink about it because in the same ward, in the same ward, what was happening? You're building, you're giving money to the Marriott family, right? This is the Marriott. This is, you know, this is Howard Johnson's. <laughs> this is the Marriott, the JW, the Marriott family, who are already known tax dodgers. We know they're tax dodgers. You check out their, their history. Um, and it's like, they, do they really need stiff money, public money to build more hotels? I mean, yeah, and I, I love Marriott hotels, by the way. <laughs> so it's like, you know, I know the inside out. That's one issue. Then who's the loser? There's a trade off, right? Sully, you mentioned there's a trade off. So the trade offs, we're going to give big corporation money, right, Lucas? We're going to give money to, we're going to give TIF money to Marriott. Winner, who loses in that trade off? What's the trade off? Who do you think loses? Marginalized populations and under resourced areas of Chicago. Right, but specifically in this situation, the loser is exactly what we keep saying, schools. Schools, yeah. Right, there it is up there. That's the breakdown. So in that real case scenario, Mary Manuel, they got out to the media that Mary is about to approve some TIF funds to go to the, to the Marriott company to support the hotel in McCormick Place. And in the same breath, what happened in that war? School, what happened with the school, the local elementary school in that ward that served black kids? What happened to it? Probably closed. It shut down, literally in the same ward, in the same, in the same circumference area, roughly, right? And so the contrast was like public media. How can you give 20 or whatever millions of dollars to this company 
And then you're shutting down this black elementary school in the same in the same time frame. How is that possible? And so what happened was that the mayor had to do some what? Face save face. He had to save face. So what did Mayor Emanuel do then? He said, "Okay, I heard you, Chicagoans. Public, remember, public opinion, public pressure. I got it. This is crazy, cranes business. All you all, even mainstream, saying this doesn't look good. <laughs> you know, you're shutting down schools." You claim to be the mayor of education. You're giving money to this rich family, blah, blah, blah. We need another hotel. Great. We're, calling, we're shutting down schools in the same ward. I'm going to take the tip money and give it to who? Navy Pier. <laughs> Build the Ferris wheel, the new Ferris wheel. You know what? Well, how much does it cost to go on that Ferris wheel? I'm a parent. I got two kids. I go to Navy Pier. They love Navy Pier. How much do you think it costs me to take them on that Ferris wheel? Parents. Person like thirty dollars, twenty thirty bucks per ride, one ride for three minutes to sit there. Okay, I'm out. Me, I'm out. Four people: my wife, me, my two kids. I'm out almost a hundred bucks just for the ride. Forget the parking, forget the food. Add that on. Go to a movie. You're talking about several hundred dollars for me to enjoy my tax dollars at Navy Pier. That's the trade-off. So here's a here's a uh, insider story on that. I just put I put the link to the story uh, in the chat. This is from Crane, Chicago, that documented this money laundering of money that was uh, supposed to go to the redevelopment of uh, the DePaul Arena, but then it was shifted by Daly to the um, uh, Mar Marriott Marquis Hotel. That got a, a shit storm, <laughs> and then it was shifted yet again to fund construction over at Navy Pier. So that, that story is documented in uh, Cranes. Now, the Civic Lab provided the deep background to Cranes Chicago and the BGA, Better Government Association's reporter. So I spent two hours with John Chase, the principal author, telling him about what we knew about how TIF money moves and you know about the tips of the ward that he was looking at. So guess what got cut out of the article? When this hit the press, all references to the Civic Lab were eliminated by the BGA and Cranes. So I point that mm -hmm. out is because we uh, we have been poking our fingers in the in the in the eyes of power for a while, and uh, though we liked the fact that this story got published, we were uh, annoyed that they cut us out of it. But that's the reality. And remember, thank you, Tom. Remember the flow, right? And you're at Paul students, right? Uh, new, uh, they're not your Adler, but Paul students were protesting their new Paul Stadium. They were like, why would we be building a stadium in the south side and we're all the way up here and you're using public money for it? Right? Miles, you got to follow the money and you're seeing this trail of just developers and big corporations and it's a whole mess. Last thing about Navy Pier, which makes it even more interesting, is Navy Pier is a nonprofit organization. You didn't know that, did you? It's a it has a nonprofit status, and um, if you look at the board of directors, I'm sure you'll find a lot of people who are what friends of who. What are you saying, Emily? Take your I'm mute. Oh, I said the mayor. Mayor and the, the top elite in Chicago, right? And no, it's no question about it. I love Navy Pier. We love Navy Pier. I mean, if you live in Chicago, you will probably end up there at some point, especially if you got kids. Um, it's, it's great in there, but not at the expense of a shitty park down the street with glass in it and no one's going to clean it up. So my kids can't play in it. Right. Not at that expense. Take some of that money and put it into our parks, back into our schools, keep our schools open for our kids. Uh, so there's, a, there's, there's always a trade-off. Cool. All right. You get the point. Thank you for my embellishing. What's the next step? After opposition, step seven. Someone read step seven. Besides you, Celia. Um, I can read it. Uh, decide who the neutral parties are. Think of powerful individuals and organizations that do not have a position on the issue. Write these names on blue post-it notes. Those are neutral parties. Place them in the center of the power matrix based on how much power they have to influence on the issue. Okay, so now 
go ahead and start brainstorming at least a couple new, potential neutral, neutral parties. Go ahead. Anybody know what, what would it, what could a neutral party be on this? I don't know about everybody else, but I had kind of a hard time thinking of ideas for this one. So I'm just gonna like maybe like small businesses that could okay. benefit yeah. one way or get hurt the other. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Neutral parties, right? Small businesses, right? I mean, did you not just hear one of your colleagues who runs a small business in the training? Weren't you a part of that training? What did, what, who's the colleague of yours that runs a small business? What's his oh, name? Eli. No, I know. I want them to know. You guys know Eli, right? And what did he say as a small business owner? What did he say about TIFFs? They don't remember? Was against them. Right, but, why, but he, at first he said he didn't even know anything about them. And when he found out about it, he felt really frustrated. He's like, I'm like suffering in the middle of COVID. I'm barely keeping my business afloat. And I'm just like kind of frustrated that there's a, there's a billion dollar slush fund and I'm running small business. Why am I not getting access to that TIF funding? And he's your colleague. He goes to Adler, <laughs> right? He runs a small business, right? So small business, actually, absolutely neutral parties. Absolutely, small business, brother. Groups. Right? And, and, and just let's just be clear. Are we talking about franchise businesses? No, right? Maybe, depends, right? Well, what happened during COVID in Chicago with franchise businesses like Popelis, which my kids like to, right? What did what happened? What happened with the money that was given out? Who was getting the money? Was small businesses getting money? Or franchise businesses. I can't hear you guys. You're nodding, shaking. Unmute yourselves. Keep your, you can keep it on mute. What do you say, Emily? <clears throat> What'd you say? The franchises got the money. Right. And specifically, remember Pop Belly? Remember that that scandal? They did what? After they after the media found out, what did Pop Belly have to do? They had to give the money back. People were like, how can you give Pop Belly millions of dollars? And yet in the same city, you've got black and brown and white and small Chicago small businesses dissolving. But yet you're giving money to a franchise Pop Bellies. Surely the inequity, the, the greed is a little bit too much here, right? You want to keep Pop Bellies going, but you can't keep you know, Lucas's big pizza company going. He's right in that same corner, right? Think about that, right? They had literally popularly had to give the money back. Check your news, because they were they were that embarrassed by public opinion. Now they didn't have to by law, right? There was no law that said give the money back that I know of, but they couldn't stand what they couldn't take a public scandal, right? So public opinion can be a critical way to get to what you want. Waiting the public, right? Because what would happen? Customers would be like, oh, I don't want to go. Why would I support Pop Bellies? I'm going to go to Lucas's Big Pizza. Through Pop Bellies. They, why are they getting money during COVID? That's a franchise. You know what I'm saying? There's a national, there's a national organization. There's national, whatever, whatever. You know what I'm saying? Stuff like that. Cool. All right. What other, what other, what other mutual parties? Right? We, we used Eli Dreyer as an example, right? He didn't know about TIFFs, he took our TIFF 101. Now he supports our campaign. So what, what um, where we put that in there, um, says neutral party could be moved to your side if they knew, that actually happened in this training, <laughs> which is kind of funny, right, Tom? Right? He's a small business owner. I am against TIFFs because how can we, how can the city be sitting on a, a billion, $1.2 billion and our businesses out here are suffering? This is Eli Dreyer, Adler graduate student. And small so, businesses are. I hope that you're beginning to see that the role of the organizer and the role of the educator are so entwined as to sometimes um, you can't tell one from the other. The ability, the ability to gather this information and, and use it in a persuasive, powerful manner 
it is a skill and a tool. So you, you're never, you're, you're always learning, you're always looking, you're gathering these, you're gathering the, 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 the study from the, from the Friends of the Parks, whatever. I posted a link to the community re, uh, profiles. So you should keep that link. That's an extensive data dump on every community in Chicago, employment, uh, household wealth. You need all that for you. So you have all that in your, at your disposal and you're you think, using your creative chops to say, well, what's the best way to put those things together to make a powerful story to, pre to present to Eli or to, to Pastor Jones? So you're, you're researching, you're educating, you're communicating, you're analyzing, and you keep going around that circle. Oh, one more, one more thing about the neutral party. It's going to hit close to home. So all of you are at Adler University. Are you trained to be counselors? Are you trained to be counselor? Is that what you want to do? You want to go out there and counsel people? Is that the idea? Mm -hmm. Yes, no, maybe? Or are you just getting this to add another alphabet soup to your name? I'm asking you, talk. Are you actually going to go out there and counsel? Yeah. Are there? Yes. Okay. So um, what are you, who would you be working for within a year or so? Think about it. You should have an idea. As, as, as graduate students going into a professional career, you should start thinking about who do you think is going to hire me? What groups, what sectors will hire me to be a counselor? Hopefully schools. Okay, which schools? Rich schools, poor schools, private, public, corporate schools, which, any school? Well, Usually well-funded schools have counselors. Underfunded schools cut resources and counselors are deaf, not even a secondary if they consider it of importance, so. Right. So put that into context in terms of the TIF funding, right? 56% of every tax, property tax dollar goes to public school. 300,000 Chicagoan kids use the public school system, 600 schools. Across, across the city of Chicago. Lots of opportunity, but those opportunities are being cut because there's not enough funding, right? And we've seen scandals, right? Inequitable funding for special ed kids, right? We've seen scandals with inequity within the funding, right? What other places? Schools, right? What other, what other institutions are hiring counselors at schools? Also, hospitals and possibly hospitals. Detention centers. Detention centers, so law, so so um, correctional services, um, or or incarceratory services, however you want to define it. Hospitals, clinics, nonprofit organizations. I worked for an organization that was a counseling service organization. I did the restored. I was a restorative justice coordinator. The other side of it was counselors, people that looked like you. I had 15 staff, majority white, who graduated from schools like Adler under me, right? Counselors, right? And where were they? They were working for a nonprofit. And where were they working? At? Where were they going to? They were going to schools and other community centers to provide a counseling service, right? So in terms of neutral parties, think about the neutral parties. It would be the very institutions that you're trying to get into, right? They may not know about the tips. They're struggling. Most counseling institutions in the nonprofit sector, at least the ones that I know, are always struggling with the bottom dollar, right? Because right now they're trying to use that, all the money, they're using the dollars follow the patient approach now with the, with the healthcare, the new healthcare stuff, right? But they're always, they're always trying to cut corners to keep their counselors on board. There's a huge turn, it's a huge turnstile for counselors in these agencies, right? Because the pay ain't good. And counselors are getting upset, especially the white counselors that, you know what, I didn't graduate from graduate school with debt to be making 35, 40, 45. This is what's put, happening uh, in the ground. I put United Way so, agencies on a blue, on a blue sticky. So right. those so would think be about all, that. The, all the potential agencies that you might work for that are providing direct services, be they counseling, whatever. And it's a very good question to ask yourselves of uh, should an agency like that be neutral? And um, to and how would how would if you were a, a st staff person, how would you advocate inside your agency to make it smarter and more likely to take a position? 
when the when your boss would say your job is not to talk about tips you you got to go counsel more young women um on your issue and uh and there's there's an influx we have more young women needing help this year than last and how would we get our board to think about this it's a huge issue and very very relevant to to you all guys and most agencies that do that they have they have a political platform they will right they may not call it a political platform but they know who to support they know which legislators to get on their side to get more resources to get more state funding right right we support senator collins because she's going to open up to help us get more mental health funds for my counseling agency so they're they, they are doing the advocacy work most nonprofits do advocacy work they don't call it that so you, as a counselor going into that field the more you know the more you can be able to play a role in making um, and, and ensuring your own trajectory, right? But also ensuring that the resources are flowing to what you need to the people that you want to help. Cool. Last step. Who wants to read step eight? Step eight. One of you read step eight, Milo or Lucas. Or Emily. For step eight, if your team is going to change this issue and make the target, solve the problem the way we want, think about how the different players need to be moved on the power matrix. All right, so we're kind of doing that. Go ahead, Milo. Oh, there was just the examples, no. Oh, yeah. Right. So how can we increase our sorry about it. go ahead, keep going. I'm sorry. Oh, it's just in step eight, how can we increase our team's power on the issue? How can we increase our allies' power on the issue? How can we move neutral players over to our position? How can we deserve or decrease the power of the opposition to move them closer to our position? And how can we move the target to agree on with our position? All right. So, yeah. And so we kind of been doing that step by step, but you kind of get the idea, right? So, how would you increase our team's power in the issue? Can anybody just throw, throw, put something down? Think about what we just went through. How would you increase our team's power on this issue? By reaching out to maybe neutral organizations. Um, and other organizations that may be on our same side and kind of work your way up. That's right. That's absolutely, absolutely right. Right, running neutral parties over. What else? Lucas, how would you increase your team's power on this issue? I'm still thinking about it. I apologize. Uh, okay, take your time, Emily. How would you how would you increase your team's power in this issue, based on what you're looking at the power matrix? Um, I apologize. This is already said. My audio keeps cutting out for some reason. Um, but just like like education, I guess, and spreading around these resources, uh, and maybe empowering people in different organizations to continue teaching their colleagues. Okay, I'll, take, I'll buy that. That's good. So some type of education process and really targeting. You mentioned colleagues, so it sounds like you want to target institutions. Okay. Yeah. Um, you could take the example of pop bellies and you, not like publicly shame, but I mean, if you get media outlets and newspapers and things to send, you know, releases for them to write uh, stories and articles about it and then if the public has a reaction to it then 
forced to take a position or make change. Okay. Tom's writing stuff in here in the chat. If you see it, if you see it. So picking up on that issue, on that example, Milo. So you, so you're you're working on this issue of tips and economic justice, and coincidentally, the story about potbelly breaks. And there's a potbelly in your community, and two blocks away is a cl school, closed school, right? Now those things are existing separately. It's you, the creativity of the organizer to realize the moment and say, guys. We need to act now. Let's have a, a march from the potbelly to the closed school. And along the way, we'll pass out flyers that will inform people about this issue and call them to a meeting at the church, which is in the middle of the route, and everybody knows it. So you're marching, marching, marching. You're doing a press event. You got a little flyer. Come to, a, come to the church on June, June 2nd. Learn about this. And you're seizing the moment. To, to make the case. And so for people, for people that this sounds like it's far away, Tiff Schmiff, what's the difference? You're helping them literally connect the dots between the location of the pot belly that's received. And you can even sh sh stand in front of the pot belly with a big uh, check. You know, pot belly got $50 million. And then you could have another sign next to it said $50 million would, would, would pay for a, a thousand teachers, you know. So you have to be ready to move when those things happen and seize the moment. But that's a great example. Cool. Awesome. How would we increase our allies' power in the issue? So you want to, obviously, why would we want to increase the allies' power? What happens when we increase the power of allies? So there are... Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Go ahead Lucas. I was going to say, so they're more aware of it if they weren't aware of uh, what is actually going on in these types of That's situations. True. Absolutely. Um, so you're increasing the awareness of allies on the issue. But what happens? What's the output? That's input. You're educating them, input. Um, output is they become more aware. But what's the other output in terms so of your, able, our team? Go ahead. So they're able to make those changes? Make the changes and you as your as the campaign will increase power inherently right yeah Does that makes sense right if i blow up you blow up you ever hear that saying before mm -hmm. friends hey if I, if I hey if i if i make it big i'm gonna make i'm gonna bring you with me right it's the same thing think about it right i'm your ally my power increases and i support your campaign what will happen to the campaign Campaign power increases, right? So how can you increase your allies' power on the issue? Speak freely. How would you increase the power of your allies? I'm an ally of yours. Huh? <laughs> What'd you say? No. no, I was, sorry, it's my son. Oh, good. Trust me, I got, I got an eight and 10 year old. Trust me, they're all over the Zoom. How would you increase your allies' power in this issue? What can you do to increase their power? Take a stab at it. Just think freely. Go ahead. Maybe doing gatherings um, with them or holding events with them would give them more leverage or more power in regards to the issue? Okay, so here's the thing, 100% correct. This isn't rocket science. It's a lot of it's about socialization and relationships, right? Right? So just think it to that lens. You're 100% right. Man, I'm gonna help you, Celia host a, a forum for your, for your people at your local youth center, right? A local gathering to learn about TIFFs and to get educated. Boom, absolutely, right? What other things can you do to help your, increase your allies' power? Uh, you can share resources. So if you share have- Share resources. 
I mean, if I have, you know, art therapists at my community center and you have athletic directors at yours, you know, we could have an art club and a basketball game combining the two organizations to help youth in both areas. Beautiful. Baseline, beautiful. Oftentimes, the, answer, the most simple thing is the answer when it comes to organizing. Sometimes it's all graphs and charts, but at the end of the day, it's about what can I offer to help you do better, right? I am an art therapist. I do great. I counsel. You seem like, you know, boom, boom, let's exchange talent, right? Uh, I just put into the chat a statement from the Rizoma Collective in Cicero to, uh, to, uh, to, to document what we're just talking about. So we did a TIFF 101 for the city of Berwyn, organized by some people there, including the Rizoma Collective. And this is what they said. Thank you for working with us in great urgency to let Berwyn community know about a new private development project attempting to utilize TIFF money. The Civic Lab was able to generate a TIFF 101 and a Berwyn TIFF workshop and live stream. We examined 150 statutes of, of individuals who said they were interested the result was we reached 55 community residents. We initially began with knowing uh, about TIFFs and then a dialogue, ultimately filling up the Berwyn Town Hall. Hidden public funds is one of the many arms of injustice we have our eyes on. In less than a week, we're able to gain some guidance about how to mobilize against a TIFF. We hope more communities can gain local information on TIFFs as a way to end corruption and springboard into a thriving and just community, literally just received by this uh, Latinx organization. So that's what we did. And to right. show you what, what John was talking about. Also, scroll up in your chat. You'll see a, a link up in there from Chicago African American Philanthropy supporting um, Asian Asians, right? A support statement around the recent uh, massacre of Asian women, right? So statements, like Tom said, supporting each other, letters of reference, the exchange of resources. Um, as and it could be just as little as it, it, it can be a service, but it also could be actual resources. Hey, I've got two vans. I noticed that you need help picking up the food every Thursday for your program, right? I'll donate my van and a driver every Thursday to help pick up food from the Chicago Food Depository for your food pantry. That actually happens. We did that in the Southwest Side. We had two vans. The local Sanat organization does a food pantry for hundreds of, of families in the Southwest Side of Chicago but they couldn't pick the food up, enough food um, from the food depository, right? And so we take our chair, our, our cushions out, we go there and one swoop, we fill up both vans and it's done every week. In return, what did she do? They did eating. Thank you so much, Jonathan. Please come in, and talk about your organizing work with our mothers. We would love to see how we can get them involved in your campaign. It's relationships. It's sharing resources. It's that simple, right? It could be that simple. Cool. How can you uh, move neutral players over to our position? We talked about that earlier, about neutral parties. More education on the subject. More education. Okay. And remember, build the relationship, right? It's a, it's a simple, simple concept that goes across the sectors. People give to people, right? You'd be surprised how much you can get if you have the relationships, <laughs> right? You can lead with the issue and that's great. But if you don't have the relationship, they may not give it to you. But if you have the relationship, even if, they, even if they're not sure about the issue, they're going to give to you. <laughs> right? So definitely more education for your neutral parties. Absolutely. Always think about assets. What assets? Asset mapping. Right? What you're doing. Like you said, Milo, match up, match up, match up. What do you have? Oh my God. I counsel all these people over here, but they have no access to after school sports services. Could we arrange a trade off, an exchange? I'll counsel your 10 people if you can provide my 10 people that I counsel with some coaching services. 
asset mapping, asset mapping, same thing with neutral parties. Not only education, what do they have to offer? What are their assets, right? You have to analyze what they have to offer and what can, what can, you, what can you exchange for? Match up, absolutely. Go ahead. All right, um, how do you decrease the power of the opposition or move them closer to your position? So you see all those opposition post-it notes, the green? The option is to do what? Two options. Do what? Neutralize their power, make them ineffective, make them, you know, remove them as a barrier. You know, we don't, you know, you're, you know, you're not going to impact us in the campaign. Or even more importantly, what do you want to do? Make them an ally. Make them an ally. Move them closer to your position. Right? We're kind of losing that art form in this country. It's all boom, 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 boom. What happened to the ground where, hey, look at, let's talk about this. This is compromise, this is build, this is negotiate. How can I get you on my side? Right? So how can you decrease the power of the opposition in this matrix? Who's the opposition? Potential labor unions, that's right. Yeah, labor unions, Navy Pier. Let's take Navy Pier. How would you get them? You're the team. You're going to go present to them, the Navy Pier. They're like, we'll hear from you guys. They're the, oh, you're that... You're that fringe youth organizing group that keeps talking about TIF funds. It's bad for us. For us. We'll, hear, we'll hear you out. Come to our subcommittee on um, you know, coalitions that we want to support. What is, are you going to present to that group to get them to um, either neutralize them or win them over? Real talk. What are you going to do? You're walking in there, you four are walking in. You represent, you represent this campaign. You already know the history of Navy Pier. You've got it. You have an opportunity to present to them some type of winning formula that gets them to support your position or at least move them closer to your position. If that, right? I guess you kind of have to understand where they're coming from first and acknowledge where they're coming from. Otherwise, they're, they may be resistant to the ideas that we present forth because they may feel like we're just completely neglecting their reasoning um okay. so that's the position i would take but then go into how we can make it better rather than saying well you're doing this and you're doing this which is causing this because no one's going to be receptive to that language is never neutral so it's like i would say recognize what they put forth but then present our data on how it's affecting other communities because maybe they don't I mean, I think they very well know what they're doing, but that's my piece. Okay, so um, you are spot on. It's almost like you took a negotiation course. Um, but seriously, this is this is real shit. This is about you. You will always have to negotiate your position in life, and if you haven't, start getting used to it. Especially as a counselor working for an agency that's paying you nothing, you're gonna have to negotiate for some stuff. But get that thick skin, start practicing now. Whatever field you're going into, if you're doing counseling work in this country, you've got to negotiate, right? My brother's a counselor at a Vietnam veteran, at, you know, that for the VA in Maine. At the end of three years, he's always negotiating his job <laughs> the last 20 years, right? So you're going to have to negotiate, keep it inside the systems, right? It's incredible. First and foremost, you always acknowledge where people are coming from. That is a classic standard protocol. Whether you're counseling, whether you're in social service, whether you're an organizer, a leader, a, board, a president, CEO, when you're engaging with, it, with someone else, one-on-one -on -one or to a group, you always acknowledge where they're coming from. Rule number one, right? You say, hey, we love what you all do. It's incredible. You, you acknowledge where they're coming from and we know where you're coming from. We understand your challenges, right? Secondly, Whatever you present absolutely has to be presented in such a way that it's going to make the situation better. I think that's a great way to look at it. Your campaign is not only to abolish it, it's to improve a situation. Right? So lead with the solution. We want healthier communities. We would love to have healthier communities in the south and west side because that would mean they can go to Navy Pier and spend more money. Oh, Chuck. Wow. Oh, my goodness. A unique selling point using their business strategies. 
It's called the USP. Here's the unique selling point. You help us make our communities healthful and wholesome by supporting this. We know it's a fact that they will come and spend more money downtown. And it happens all the time. Unique selling point, right? Make it better. Lead with the positive and lead with what's a win-win victory. Language is never neutral, as Silly has said. It's huge. Lastly, the third thing is always negotiate for what more than for more than you want, and always have what your best alternative, right? Your baton, as they say in the FBI, your best alternative, like the thing that you're gonna fall back on at the very least. Can we get this support? You may not get the full hundred percent revoke, and we're gonna get you this and this, but we're not gonna get in your way. Wow. You mean the board, the Navy Pierce not gonna get in our in our way. They're not gonna do what they usually do, stop. Something. They're gonna sit in the sidelines and watch this campaign. That could be your best alternative negotiated agreement, right? So always have that bat and always have that that thing that you that you can that you know that you're gonna you wanna get no matter what. Okay, when you negotiate. Okay, cool. And lastly. How can we move the target to agree with our position? Jump in there. How are you gonna, how are we gonna move the target to agree with our position? Yes, it's possible. And yes, you should fight for that always. But how would you do it? Like identifying some shared goals. Okay. That's huge. Identify shared goals. I firm that these are shared goals. Okay, that's great, right? Hey, we all want the same thing. We want healthy families. We want to reduce violence in some of these neighborhoods. Uh, can we agree? Can, can we agree on that? Right? Oh, we would love to have kids with more jobs. Can we agree on those outputs, right? So an output, right? What are the shared outputs? It's similar to goals, but it's more like more concrete in many ways, right? So a shared output could be, we want our young people, Chicagoans, um, either in school or working. We don't need them on the corners. We don't need them. Um, between 2 p.m. and 7 p.m. with no resources. We want the output is that they're working and they're productive members of our community. That would be a shared outcome, right? So maybe building that shared outcome, shared goals approach. Absolutely, what else can you do? One more thing. I would say it's important also to build a positive relationship with the target. Like we covered earlier with, you know, building those relationships and socializing. That's right. Well, that's huge, right? Know thy enemy from within, right? It's a lot harder. Remember, my Celia, Lucas, Emily, we're all human beings in Chicago. And even if you disagree with me, that doesn't mean you're not human. That doesn't mean you don't have feelings. So if I'm opposed to you, I need to know you. Right? The art of war. Know thy enemy. Right? Win the enemy over before you even fight the battle. How do you do that? Have a relationship. Right? Keep your enemies closer, they say, right? <laughs> Ever hear that thing? Right? Know your enemy. Right? Know who you're up against. When we ran our campaigns against Mayor Daly, a lot of us were working with Mayor Daly on some task forces. We knew. You know who um, Mayor Daly's wife was? Maggie Daly? She was the chair of our initiative that funded us, even though we were taking on her husband on these campaigns. I used to hang out with Maggie Daly at my youth center. <laughs> even though Matt, Matt, Papa Daly, the husband, knew that was a pain in his ass when it came to organizing for young people in Chicago. We knew each other because we're all here in Chicago. We're all Chicagoans and it's okay. It's okay. It's gotta be personal sometimes. 
that's where that's where the contradictions are created, right? Come on, you know, I work with Mayor Daly. I worked on his summits. And at the same time, I also held him to task on jobs and violence prevention, and all these things. So absolutely build the relationships. It's not, it's not, it's gotta be fluid. You gotta know. I worked with Mayor Lightfoot on the task force. So I know Mayor Lightfoot, right? But she also knows that we're, I'm one of her strongest crit crit critiques, right? Critics. And it's okay. That's that's the name of the game. So absolutely. So ultimately, you can move your target in so many ways, right? right? And so I think definitely those are some some ingredients to that madness of how do you win your target over? And sometimes winning your target means you've got to do what? Overwhelm your target with what? Numbers. So Lori Lightfoot commands $12 billion worth of resources. You know that, right? It's a city budget plus another $12 million into all those boards that she appoints. CDH, all that influence, right? So it's around 20 billion or 22 billion or something like that, 24 billion. Do I have do we have 24 billion dollars in our in our war test? Probably not, right? So what do we have in terms of numbers? What can we build and have when you're taking on power if you don't have the money? What do we have? Wow, power. We went over this in the organizing. What, what type of power do we want to exercise if we don't have money power? Support in the community, community members. People power. Two words, people power. Support in the community. We got the people. We work with the people every day. We're counselors. I counsel, you know, 100 clients every, every, every month across 20 schools. I have access to institutions and leadership. No, I have to know people to get into those schools. I got to know the discipline officers. I got to know the team captains or whatever, right? The vice principals and all this stuff. So we have we have access to people, right? So you can move the target <laughs> by organizing the people. And I, you know, what we see a lot of times what happens with politicians when you organize the people and masses. What happens? They kind of shift, don't they? Because they realize, oh, shit, those are votes. Those are potential votes. Yes, I support you all. I'm going to work with you to make sure we get police reform or education reform or finance reform. You, you've shown me the way. Thank you for that 50,000 petition list you submitted. <laughs> now I know that you're serious. Or the 500 meetings you've had. Or the 500 people that showed up to my finance committee meeting. You're on the radar now. Cool. Um, so that's the matrix in a nutshell. And sometimes the matrix can take a couple of days. It can, it can take up to a month. When we did this for our jobs campaign, it took us four weeks with our young people because we had we had them do the research. We had them do the research on, on, the, on the commissioners, right? Who's the commissioner of workforce? Who's their senior leadership? We had them do research and learn how to do research and really study it from the inside. So when they launched the campaign against Mayor Daly, um, all avenues were covered. These were young people in high school, junior high, not adults in graduate level. These were young people, black, brown, and white, hip hop artists, like you said, sports athletes, after school kids. They were organizing, you know, a multi million dollar ask, and they got it. They saved 20,000 jobs, 20,000 summer jobs, or 20,000 Chicagoans using this power matrix, utilizing this matrix. They took on zero tolerance utilizing the matrix. They changed the school discipline code for CPS, which is going to be very, you're going to have to learn that. It's a huge issue when it comes to counseling in terms of we serve justice counselors, public schools, if you're looking for jobs. So, any other thing, Tom? Jump in there. Anything else? We're done. I'm done. We're good. Well, um, I'm, I'd like to hear from people, you know, how this has landed, this process. Yeah, I just want to say thank y'all for taking us through this step by step. Um, there was definitely a couple of things that I was confused about as far as, you know, the opposition um, and just some of the other aspects that we were able to discuss. So just really appreciate that. And um, it's just helped me find a, or see a better understanding as far as these topics and issues when it comes to um, 
than he's in Chicago. And does Lucas, this process make sense to you? Yeah, I have a better understanding of it now. So I appreciate that. Thank you all. Everybody else? I liked this process. Um, it makes sense to me, like going step by step and going through and talking about it. Um, yeah, I appreciate it. Thank you so much. And the terms that we are using, targets, opposition, neutral parties, are these terms that you've run across before? No. So we invite you to reflect on the kind of learning and the kind of brain power you need, the spirit that you need to bring to this work. And um, it's it's great that we're talking about it here, but frankly, we think you should be have ex should be exposed to it in other spaces. And we hope that that will be the case. And this won't be it, well, you know, it should yeah. be strange. It should be it should be just part of your toolkits. We think, right? Well, and I'm surprised it should be part of your training particularly if you're coming out of graduate level, because um, every institution you work in does their power matrix. And you're being placed within that institution. If you wanna go work for, for a public education system, you wanna go work for um, a nonprofit or for a hospital, all of these institutions do their power analysis, their market and power analysis. So this is, a, this is specific for organizing, but there is a version of this across every sector, the technology, um, social service sector, everything. And Those what do people protocol. make of the word power? So we've used the word power all the time. Is that a term that you're used to talking about? Yes. Yes. Okay. And in, in what context do you have, have you discussed power? Oh, we're always checking our position of power and privilege, like, and of our intersectionalities and what power I have when I walk into a room and what privilege I have when I walk into a space and what I do with my power and privilege because every person has a power and a privilege. So if you were always checking it so that if you acknowledge it and you're aware of it, then you can use it, you know, for the better good. So yes, you're, we're, we're trying to be cognizant of that from the personal, you know, what's your, what's your, um, identity lasagna, as we sometimes call it. But what about this word of power in public as we're using it now, collective power? How does that strike you? Is this something that is, is, is useful, meaningful, uh, unsettling, makes you uncomfortable? I don't know, but I, I do, I appreciate that we went through this in the step-by-step -step because I feel that um, it gives me more hope that like individually I do have power to make, create change if I work and do these things, identify all these different things because being from Chicago and listening to the narrative of being from a broke city and it's just there's you know the south side's always going to be poor and broke and you know north side's always going to be flourishing and wealthy um it can be defeating mm -hmm. and so changing the narrative is um is hopeful right yeah huge uh, I, Change, I, it's a huge statement changing the narrative is not only hopeful but that is also part of the winning process that's, you don't that's change the narrative. You know you won when, right. when they use your story <laughs> in, in a way. Right. Um, and it, it's, it's like, because the mind is where a lot of this lives. So I guess what I was probing for um, is, you know, discussions of community power and moving targets sometimes sounds very confrontational and, and, and had, we're talking about conflict and friction. And we are, absolutely. Um, Remember the thing we started reading when we started talking about organizing, the famous quote of Frederick Douglass. Would someone like to re remind us of that quote from Frederick Douglass and connect it to this work that we did today? 
What did Mr. Douglas say? Paraphrase it. He has know it. Probably, probably SJP trainings too. I think we just went through it today. First, or if not, you're going to. If you haven't taken your um, SJP trainings today, or no, Friday, Amen. That's Friday. What did he say about conflict? There's no struggle. There's no progress. That's that it. One? Mm -hmm. That's the one. And so he taught us that so long ago, but basically since there've been slaves and oppressed people since time began, it's in the Bible. There is no liberation without struggle. It's not possible. There is no justice without struggle. It's not possible. So we hope that by showing you all the piece parts to this, to this little puzzle that we presented to you, you can see how it would be possible to move this issue in Chicago against great odds. And remember the, the expanded quote of Frederick Douglass, right? Not only is there no struggle, but oftentimes we're seeing people want what? The rain without the thunder, right? The oceans without the roar, right? People want the success without the struggle. They want the, the goods, right? Without, without the pain and the, and the work, sweat, right? All that stuff, right? And so if you want things to change, if you want to change the narrative, um, you talked about Chicago narrative that as, as old as Chicago is, it actually predates colonials. It goes from the pre-colonial days up to now, the Chicago that you talk about, Milo. The tale of what, two cities, three cities? We've been in that narrative for a long time. Um, the South side versus the North side versus the West side. It's all ingrained in our DNA. If you want to change that narrative, there's going to be a struggle. And it could be with words, it could be with blows, it could be a moral struggle, it could be a political struggle, it could be all of the above. But it's going to be a struggle, right? And remember, tyrants, the limits of tyrants are only prescribed by those whom they oppress, right? In other words, as Americans, our endurance to put up with a lot of shit is pretty intense by now. That's the, that's the beast of capitalism. You know, we were putting up, we, we were enduring so much coming at us that, oh, as long as I got my TV, my car, my house, you know, a paying job, I can take care of my kids. I'm not too worried about what's out there until it comes into my house or impacts my ability to function as a parent or as a human or whatever it is, right? But that tyrant, what are tyrants doing in, in the United States? They're testing us. How much more do you want to put up? Hey, how many more people do you want to shoot? How many more men should, should how many more women should die in our society? Right? How many more politicians do we elect who are rapists and sexual abusers? And we think about it. We have a huge tolerance level. We've elected a president who actually rapes, rapes women. I mean, think about it. We've got a governor of New York who now has an alleged litmus of, 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 of harassing women. Right? How much more? Right? Limits of tyrants are only prescribed by those whom they oppress. That's Frederick Douglass. So it's up to you for, it's up to us on the screen to make change happen. Ain't nobody gonna change it for you. Ain't nobody gonna come to your rescue. Oh, great, Milo, you're great. You're, oh, we love you. We're gonna give you that six figure salary. You're gonna, be, you're gonna be great. You're already awesome. Lucas, you're great. Don't worry about it. You, you have a right to education. Don't worry about your debt, it's covered. That's a human right. No, hey, that's not how it's going now, right? That's not happening, right? You are graduate students, right? You are the, you are, if you look at the numbers in this country, you're in the, you are getting something that a lot of people aren't. So to whom much is given, much is expected. That's what my dad thought. That was a Marine. He was a Lieutenant in the Korean War. He trained me to be a leader. I'm a son of a Marine officer. He always told me, you've got so much more, so you better be doing something with your life. And so I'm, I'm passing that message on to you from my family. Who much is expected, much is, you know what I'm saying? So when you graduate, Adeline, you're out there, and hopefully in five years you check back, say, hey, JP, we're at, I'm in whatever, Alaska doing whatever, or I'm over in Dubai doing whatever we're doing. I expect you to be report back and be like, we're kicking ass. I'm taking the shit on. I'm doing such great work. And by the way, here's a contract. Thank you for that. 
Rick Lab. We'll give you a good song gig. Just joking. No. Um, but that's the point. Okay. So thank you guys. Um, any other observations? Power matrix analysis. Take this with you. Everything we give you is it add, add this to your toolkit. Right. And there's multiple ways of looking at this, but this can again give you that edge in terms of your professional identity formation in your career as well. You're going to go in there with more information and more preparation than you think. Yes, Thomas. And I put the uh, results of our work today into the chat. So it's hey. Civic Lab Power Matrix with today's date. So this is this is the result of your collective brains with our prompting and coaching. But you can imagine the long process of doing this now that you've been through it and you can see where the places come and go where you group and regroup. We don't know. We got to go get more information. So we have to come back together again. So it's like a living thing that happens. Jonathan said it could take weeks, could take could take that la much that much time. It gets revised. Um, you can see how um, if this is a, a living learning thing. It's and creativity is part is part of it. So you're you're using your peripheral vision. You're aware of what's happening in the news. You know you're not you're not in in, in a foxhole here. You're you're your bug. You're you're collecting. You're working, um, and um, you can see the trial and error of it too. You have theories and you try something and you visit people and you may be surprised. You, you may think that the ally that was going to be so strong with you, you go to them and you find some hidden relationship and they hate you. And now you, you bring that back. You go to somebody who th you, you think might be uh, oppositional and you realize, guess what? We have more in common. It, it can only be done by the doing of it. So Hopefully this was a good, uh, a good taste. Awesome. Anything else, guys? Appreciate it. Thanks for, uh, I know it's a lot, but I appreciate you all going through this and hopefully um, you can take away what you need from this for your own practitioner work. Um, next steps, Thomas, do you want to outline what, what the next steps are? Well, I think we need, we need to continue our meeting for next Saturday when we're going to talk about the Harambe and your role in driving um, uh, attendance. So I think that's that's what we're going to just concentrate on mm -hmm. next Saturday. I think that'll be plenty because we're going to talk about the Harambe and we want to get you excited about it. And then we want to give you your roles and really make sure you understand it and actually maybe do some role playing. So that's, okay. what, that's, that's what I think we should do next Saturday. Awesome. Okay, cool. cool. Thank you guys. Have a great um, weekend. Just want to do a quick check out, one word check out. Start, Thomas. Uh, energized and uh, and happy. You can call someone else out besides me. Lucas. Informed. CC. Enlightened. Milo. Uh, hopeful. Emily. I was gonna say informed, motivated. And my brother, Jonathan. I am exhausted and can't wait to get off. I can go watch, so I can go binge my Netflix. All right, with that, we say stay safe, everybody. We'll see you next Saturday. See you next Saturday. Thanks. Ashe. Thank you. Okay.